906 Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. I woke up this morning with my usual mile long list of things to do. And then I looked outside and found this. So what do you do on a balmy 30 degree UP morning with 6 inches of fresh snow and more on the way? Throw away the list and go camping. And there aren't many things that say UP small town community like a good old smelt fry. 9 million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, 2 time zones, and 1 area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. Camping is something that typically should probably involve a bit of planning, but I tend to do things more on the spur of the moment. So when I woke up to fresh snow, it didn't take long to decide I wanted to be in it. So I crammed the usual stuff into a backpack, grabbed some food and a tarp, and ventured off in search of somewhere to relax. Now this isn't some sort of survival test. I won't be eating any grubs or balsam pitch or rubbing any sticks together to start a fire. I'm not out here for that. I'm out here for, well, nothing. I'm out here just to be out here. If you're watching this and thinking maybe you'd like to give it a whirl, do it. You can make it as easy or as complicated as you like. You can venture deep into the UP wilderness or go in your own backyard. You can bring the bare essentials or you can bring the kitchen sink. Scavenge for food or bring a T-bone steak. I think just the fact that you do it is more important than how. So what do you really need? For me, the top of the list includes a hatchet, a knife, and a way to start a fire. The main concerns are shelter, food, and heat. We'll start with shelter. For me, I like to have a roof over my head for obvious reasons. It keeps the snow or the rain off and maybe helps to hold a little heat depending on how you set it up. Your shelter can consist of a pile of sticks and some brush or something you bring along like a tarp. Add in some rope or if you leave at the spur of the moment and can't remember where you left your rope, try out some ratchet straps. Tarp ties are one of the handiest things I keep in my backpack. You can build it small or big enough to stand up in. It certainly doesn't have to be complicated. The type of shelter you build can be greatly determined by the time of year or the temperature to be more specific. I'm out here in April. The temp is in the high 20s to mid 30s, so heat is not really that much of a determining factor, so I'm not too worried about staying warm. Nine oh six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for Premier Power Sports products. Next on the to-do list is fire. Ground up some dry grass, some leaves, even a bird nest, or throw a couple of Uper fire starters in your backpack. Add some sticks and you're on your way.
for me, fire is probably the most essential part of the adventure. It can provide as much heat as you need to stay comfortable. It's the difference between cold food and a good hot meal. And not to be understated, it provides company. It's nearly impossible to go camping, even on the hottest of summer days, without building a fire. It's the centerpiece of the campsite. Everything seems to revolve around the fire pit. One of the obvious benefits of fire is the difference between a cold bottle of water and a hot cup of coffee. I'm not necessarily much of a coffee drinker, but sitting under a tarp on a chilly day, watching the snow come down in the middle of the woods, I can't think of too many things that are a better fit. There's plenty to do on a trip like this. Setting up camp, hitting firewood, building a fire, getting more firewood, cooking, and getting more firewood. But be sure to spend some time doing nothing. Just taking it all in. You might be in an area you've walked through countless times hunting or hiking, but everything around you takes on a different perspective when you sit and stare at it for a while. Next on the agenda, dinner. For dinner, one thick juicy venison hamburger cooked over the fire. And a nice tasty homemade campfire bun. And a couple of homemade beers. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. When it comes to food, 
You have all kinds of options. You could schedule your trip to coincide with rabbit season and hope to add that to your menu. Or maybe camp next to a lake and plan on some ice fishing. It's hard to beat fresh fish. Or you might be the type of person that likes to live on roots and berries. I'm not. Without a doubt, one of the most memorable parts of a trip like this is the food. So you can bet my menu is going to include some sort of meat and it's going to get cooked over a fire. If you're going to bring food along, your menu is only limited by what you want to carry in. Hamburgers, hot dogs, brats, steak. Wrap up a pasty in some tin foil and toss it in the fire. Regardless of what you eat, it's going to taste better cooked over a fire in a place like this. As the light fades, the temperature begins to drop. The sound of the melted snow dripping on my tarp stops. Eventually the birds go silent. Quieter and quieter, until there's nothing but the soothing sound of the fire. I can hear the snowflakes hitting the ground. I woke up to just enough fresh snow to change the backdrop from gray to white. First order of business, firewood. As good as fire feels during the day, it feels even better in the morning. One of the coolest parts about sleeping in the woods is waking up there. Coffee smells better, bacon smells better, smell of wood smoke. Yeah, breakfast in the woods is hard to beat. If you're watching this and thinking maybe that you'd like to give it a whirl, do it. It doesn't need to be hard work, it doesn't need to be complicated. Matter of fact, that's exactly what it shouldn't be. It's about simpler things like making coffee and cooking over a fire, hearing nature and seeing things you would otherwise not notice. Maybe it's not so much what it is about, but what it isn't. It's the absence of all things typical, things automatic push a button to make coffee or pull a handle to get water, a thermostat, and maybe a little bit of reassurance that if we wanted to, if we had to, we could get by without all those things. I think that ability is probably buried away in just about everybody. And for us, because of where we live, how we live, it's just a little closer to the surface. I'm guessing that right about now, you're probably picturing the perfect camping spot in your own neck of the woods. Grab a frying pan and a hatchet and go there. Do it for the experience. For the sights, sounds and smells of nature. Do it for no reason at all. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Nutrafeed. 
nutritional feed solutions for deer and horses. Today's Wild Game Break is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Find out more at cookingwildseasonings.com. Well, spring is right around the corner, and that means all sorts of wildlife activity. And the melting snow can reveal all sorts of hidden treasures. Here's outdoor writer, photographer, and videographer Richard P. Smith with a great reason to get out in the woods this spring. One of the activities that's good to do in the spring is shed hunt. Look for antlers that bucks have lost during the winter. Once the snow melts, uh, going to areas, yarding areas where bucks spend a lot of time looking for bedding areas or the main trails they followed to feeding areas are excellent places to look for shed antlers. And one of the best ways to get shed antlers is to be with the buck when he loses his antlers as I did last winter. I saw an eight point, he'd already lost one antler when I hooked up with him and I was with him for about an hour and saw him lose his second antler and I managed to get both of the beams. Travel through the Upper Peninsula in the spring of the year and you're bound to run across a sign somewhere that says Smelt Fry. Here's a look at one that's been going on for over 50 years. Well, tonight we're cleaning smelt. Uh, this is for the 54th annual uh, Faithorn Fire Department Smelt Fry. Uh, they do come in pre theoretically pre-cleaned, but you know, they always leave a few uh, goodies in the thing, so we go through all the smelt. Uh, I pretty much call everybody in the Faithorn, in Faithorn Township. We end up with a pretty good crew at times, as many as 25, 30 people uh, down cleaning smelt. This year we, we have about uh, 225 pounds of smelt that we're cleaning. This year is later than we've ever done the smelt fry because where Easter fell was the usual weekend we do the smelt fry. So we cut back a little bit. We go back into the 70s, we used to do about 500 pounds of smelt. Majority of the time we're around 300, but we cut it back a little bit this year, judging by how late the, the thing will be. But 225 pounds of smelt, still a lot of smelt to clean, but it, it beats the 500. <laughs> I know people, we call them for cleaning smelt, and they say, I've been waiting for the call, I knew it was coming. So, and we have people, I make a point of catching people who are new in the community, and these people get a chance to meet some of their neighbors when they're helping out with the stuff, and people have thought it's great along that line. It's a good community event. The smelt we do a we pan fry them, flour, salt, and pepper, and people say they're the best smelt they've ever had. They're good. With it being the 54th year of the smelt fry, it started uh, with my my father-in-law uh, Larry Reed and my wife's uncle uh, Slip Carlson started it as a fire department uh, dinner back in 1963. They went out and dipped the smelt. First one was held at the house I live in now. They cleaned the smelt in the basement and then they had a fire department dinner. And it evolved over the years to the point of uh, turning it into a fundraiser. Back in the 70s it had turned into a quite a party night. And they, so they think they sold more alcohol than they sold smelt. Uh, we don't do the alcohol part of it anymore with the way that uh, the liability and stuff has come. We, do, we just don't do the alcohol as part of the dinner anymore. But we, we range anywhere from 300 to 600 people for the dinner. It's kind of interesting, we will serve that many people here on the Friday night for the smelt fry, and the Long Branch down the road will serve probably the same number of people. So you get a town of Faithorn that has 250 people and we'll have 1,200 people in town for fish on Friday night. And with a fire department fundraiser, almost everybody from town is working at either the bar or here, so it's everybody coming from out of town to work here with this thing. The town hall where we have the smelt fry was the school through 63 or 64 when the Faithorn consolidated schools with Norway. And it's not a really large building, as you can see, but we can seat about 100 people at one time in the hall. So when we serve you know, three to 600 people, we turn it over three to six times in the evening. And it takes a lot, a lot of hustling to keep people going through the line and uh, keep places clean. I know that's where our scouts come in helping out with the stuff. With they're good table bussers. I know we have businesses that help out a lot. The Long Branch donates stuff for us. Uh, pretty much everybody in the township, whether it's eggs for the potato salad or it's uh, 
uh, radishes or uh, or celery, whatever it happens to be, they, people are donating those items, and other people donate the materials for making the baked beans. So you know, the only real expense is the smelt. I've been involved with this for about 15 years, and the price of smelt has gone from about a dollar a pound to almost five dollars a pound. So I'm. It's no longer the inexpensive fish that it used to be. It's becoming the delicacy. This is the major fundraiser that the fire department does. I know for us, it's uh, we're a small town without a lot of tax base, so we've got a lot of our equi equipment through either federal grants or grants from the casino, and all of them have co-pays. So we've been able to, with, with the fundraising from this, we've been able to purchase, over the last 10 years or so, we've purchased uh, all new clothing uh, for the fire department with the paying the copay out of our smelt fry money. Two years ago we bought a new grass fire truck with our smelt fry money Then we've purchased used trucks from other departments with the money from here too. It's, it's a major fundraiser and it's a, what allows our fire department to operate because the tax base doesn't do much. <laughs> it's one of the things to make sure, you know, thanking everybody for doing it because who comes because that's what you know, allows our department to operate. Right? We're, we're a town, the township is a population of uh, about 250 and we have 15 people on the fire department. I mean, that's 15 active people who've trained. It happens because of the community we have. If you go through the people, the population and the ones who are formerly on the department, I don't think there's many people who haven't been involved in the uh, fire department or the rescue squad in Faith Orn. Almost everybody has. It's a real community event. Majority of the people in the township donate something towards it, whether it's a bag of flour for the things, or make bars, or lemonade, or coffee. Uh, the only thing we really purchase is the uh, smelt themselves. That's, I mean, that's the biggest thing. I, I grew up in Lower Michigan in a, in Grand Rapids, larger, you know, the larger city. But it's just, it's fabulous the small town feel as a result of this smelt fry. I and mean, this and the other the other community meals that happen in town here, whether it's the Rescue Squad or the uh, Methodist Church with their dinners, that all of them are community functions. It doesn't matter who, what you belong to, everybody helps out. Thanks for watching and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.